Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get yourself a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash sweet story, bro. With over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, man, you're spoiled for choice with something to listen to. So I know what you're going to do as soon as this show is ended. You're going to head over to audibletrial.com slash sweet story, bro, and pick yourself up something free today. Warning, this podcast is likely to contain numerous instances of vulgarity and or profanity, which some may deem inappropriate. If you're of an overly sensitive disposition, stop listening now. Additionally, the podcast will be filled with numerous spoilers throughout, so if you haven't had the opportunity to read, watch, or enjoy the story prior to the show, please do so, before continuing with this episode of Sweet Story, Bro. Get ready for action! Hey yo, podcast land, your friend, writer Steve Russell here, welcoming you back to another episode of Sweet Story Bro. Now, you don't need, you don't need to tell me, I know it's your favorite bi-weekly story podcast. Yes, 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 it's that time again, another two weeks have passed. We've had the Monday mention telling you what the story was for this week's episode. I assume you guys have either read, watched, played, or whatever it happened to be to get this story. In this case, it would have been read it. Um, so that this episode, you can enjoy it on a deeper level because you can appreciate every beat-for-beat beat moment I go. Think of it like a boxer with his opponent, only I'm going toe-to-toe, beat-for-beat with the written word, man, trying to understand what makes a story good, what makes a story bad in order to determine what, if that story is officially too sweet or officially just not sweet enough. Thank you so much for downloading this uh, latest episode. I really hope you enjoyed the last show on Justice League, colon, the Flashpoint Paradox. For longtime listeners of the show or if you're just coming along to the show for the first time, you here, here's the kind of setup of, of how we do this. I go beat for beat with a story in order to determine whether I like it or not, if it's officially too sweet or just not fish, uh, officially just not sweet enough. But of course, doing that is never the same as reading or, or watching the movie or the book it's yourself. So there's always that impetus for you to go, hey, man, that sounded really good. I want to check it out. And thanks to my new sponsors, Audible.com, you can do that. You heard the advert at the start. Do check it out. It really helps me out. And you get to get a free fucking book. Free audiobook. What, what, what's the complaint about? Free is the best cost around. No catches. So, what have I been up to, man? Since we last spoke, how's temporary doing? How's all that stuff going with the cover letter and all that shit? I'm currently redrafting the synopsis because it is somewhat of a challenge to condense down over 100,000 words into just over a two-page synopsis. You know, breaking down every major element into its core fundamental, yet making it an engaging read. It's a difficult task, one I'm up to, one that's fun and engaging, but difficult nonetheless, I have to admit. If only because, as any author will tell you, how do you condense all those words down into into such a slimline version of your own story? How you know the the immediate reaction a lot of people might have is my work is far too genius for that. You can't condense it down. You can't boil it down. It's far too convoluted and clever, and nuanced. No, that's not true. You can do it. I'm doing it right now. And if an idiot like me can do it, you can too. The cover letter is pretty much done. I got a great tweet from a writer friend of mine, Katya. I've mentioned her on the show before uh, through my private Twitter account, my personal one, at Steve Tendo, by the way, if you're interested in following me on a more personal level. The show one's there at Sweet Story Bro. Do check that out too. But if you want to follow me on on a closer, more uh, personal level, feel free to follow me on Twitter, man. That's the easiest way. I don't really use Facebook. Sweet Story Bro does have a Facebook if you want to follow it there, but I I don't really utilize it as much as the Twitter. But yeah. It, the, the cover letter is pretty much done. There's just a couple things. The tweet that Katya sent over was this really cool image, um, kind of a, a graph. Have you done this? Have you done this? Does it do, do this? Does your cover letter do this? Yes or no? And it dictates whether you need to research more, go back to the drawing board, or if you're ready to submit your cover letter. And let me tell you, there's a lot of steps involved in order to get it to a point where this graph deems it ready to send. I was thrilled to find out that I was not – uh, it, it's in a closer, more ready state than I gave it credit for, especially utilizing the graph given. I was worried that I would read this and go, shit, I've got to rip it up and start all over again. No, I do not. And that is great news for me because I didn't want to do that because – 
fuck me. It's been hard enough as it is to get it in a great position. And the next step, of course, would be to actually commit to finding the literary agents, finding uh, these agencies and sending it out to them. So, of course, you know, there's going to be a little bit of redrafting there too in the sense of having to personalize it a little bit. So it's not just a blanket email. You don't want to do that. They can tell because it will lack charisma. It will lack charm. It will lack character. You got to put that work in. I, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at two books right here in my office where I record the show, where I write. There have been two books on my desk pretty much nonstop for the past few months, and that's the Writers and Artists Yearbook 2016, as well as their companion piece getting published. I've got a couple of other books that I make reference to. I mean, to my right here, I've got Stephen King's On Writing, a memoir. And um, they're all great books, really handy to have at arm's length, literally, in order to make reference to as I'm going. But, but... I need to commit. I need to overcome this fear because it's getting to this this this, this point now where it, it seems to just be self-sabotage. I'm sure I've talked about this during the intro of the show before, and it just made me think of Dune. And if you've not read Dune, do yourself a favor. It is one of the best sci-fi books, highly regarded and thought of as such by so many people, and rightfully so. I used this quote on one of my friends at Jiu-Jitsu in order to help him with uh, competitions um, anxiety. I don't compete myself. I do it for the health reasons and to better myself as a, as a person with martial arts. Uh, co- competitions never really, never really called out to me in the way it has to these guys. As I'm sure a lot of you who are familiar with it, I, you're probably going to know the quote that I'm going to pull. For those that do not, you're welcome. This is such a great quote. Carry this with you in life in general. And I quote from the master, Frank Herbert, Within his book, Dune, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. End quote. And it's true with the self-sabotage that I might be putting upon myself with this, uh, how scared I am about putting it out there and being told this isn't good enough. Despite the, the year's work, I've, I've slogged and, and crawled towards the finish line, and it's almost there now, so why fucking stop? Just do it, dude. That's to me. That's a personal message for me to me when I'm editing this. Only I will remain. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Just do it. Commit. Whatever you're doing in your life, if you're putting it off because you're scared of what the repercussions could be, um, as long as it, you know, especially on a creative endeavor, just do it. Just give it a go. What's the worst that could happen? Just try. Or if you subscribe to the Master Yoda uh, line of thinking, do or do not, there is no try. I can't do it now. No, it's no good. Sorry, guys. But hey, before we get into the nitty gritty of the show, Just like always, i got to remind you to subscribe to the show on iTunes so that you never miss one. As soon as it's uploaded onto the servers, iTunes subscribers are the first to get it, as well as the guys who who follow me on SoundCloud slash Sweet Story Bro. You are the first that will know that there's a new episode uploaded. The rest, hey, if you're not subscribed, you may have to wait a little while until those iTunes servers, those pesky servers refresh and it appears why bother with that at all? Hit the subscribe button. Costs you nothing. Costs me nothing, but helps the show so much. you got no idea. Follow me on Twitter, Sweet Story Bro. Like us on Facebook, Sweet Story Bro Podcast. And, of course, subscribe on YouTube as well. If you happen to have a YouTube account, go like those videos, man. Every little thing helps the show. And every time you help the show, an angel gets its wings. That's true. Prove me wrong. But, hey, I'll tell you something. If all those links are too much for you, that's not a problem. I got you sorted. You can check out SweetStoryBro.com for everything all in one handy place. SweetStoryBro.com. So that leads us on now naturally to why this story. Why did we pick Philip Reeves' book? Mortal Engines. Well, actually, it all stems from a conversation I had with my friends and one of the very first bros to the show, Johnny Mac, who has long been championing this book. He read it as a as a child, uh, I think he said, or as a teenager, and uh, he was quite taken with it. And he was excited by the prospect of the fact that Peter Jackson has expressed an interest in directing this movie. uh, I'm sorry, directing this book as a movie. Uh, The research I did shows that that's actually quite old news. So. 
I would have hoped that with the sway that he has had since Lord of the Rings, that it would have moved a little faster. Perhaps we would have been living in a world that already has Mortal Engines as a movie, but we don't. And hey, man, you know, film productions, they're convoluted events. Things go forward. They slow down. They come to a screeching halt completely. And sometimes projects fall apart. I get that. But the idea of Peter Jackson being interested in this and wanting to develop it as a movie uh, concept, possibly as a franchise series, is quite a, an intriguing idea, actually. But that's the reason why behind this story, this is actually the very first recommendation from one of the bros of the show. one of you guys, one of your very own, reaching out to me and saying, I really like this story. I think you would really like this story. I think it's a good fit for the podcast. Read it. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. And I actually sent out a tweet about it. I, I tweeted a picture of me with the book. And Philip Reeve, the author himself, saw it and retweeted the fucking tweet, which is pretty cool. You can always go back through the timeline in order to see that. But that was pretty neat, man. You know, a lot of people getting a lot of attention to the show. More and more people seem to be checking out every time I launch a new episode, which is great. Welcome, if this is the first time that you are checking out the show. And welcome back to the people that check it out every time I release one. Couldn't do this without you. Appreciate the help and the support, no matter how small, no matter how minor, or how large it is. I appreciate it. And tell all your friends, man. Let's fucking halo effect this shit. Tell people, other people tell people, so on and so forth. But why this story? Because it was recommended to me by one of my listeners. And I just need to highlight that I love what you guys do. I love the feedback you've given me. It helps me craft a better show. Please keep giving me the feedback. Let's evolve this show together because it's just as much yours as it is mine. But that is why Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve is the subject for this episode number 12 of Sweet Story Bro. So without further ado, let's jump into this world that Philip Reeve has helped craft and create for us. One filled with engines powering cities that go from place to place in order to destroy, consume for parts, and potentially kill the civilians and citizens of other smaller town suburbs. It's a town eat town world, man. We're just living in it. So allow me to present you with a dystopian-esque future here. And I'm going to read the back of the book, the synopsis, so you get a really good idea of what Philip's trying to do. Philip is what I call him. We're friends like that. You know, he, he retweeted me, I tweeted him, you know, and that's how it works. So, London is on the move again. In the distant future, cities on wheels fight each other for survival. As London pursues a small town, young apprentice Tom is flung out into the wastelands, where a terrifying cyborg begins to hunt him down. And that's it. That's, that's the synopsis. Less than a full paragraph. Well, it is a paragraph, but it's a very short paragraph. And that's enough to get a lot of people maybe intrigued in the world that Philip Reeve wants to create and craft. So let's get to it. And straight away, one of the first observations I had in regards to his story, in regards to his writing style, and how he's approaching this entire thing, I think we were pretty much dropped straight into the mythology of the world. You know, this really takes in this sort of like learn to sink or swim mindset as we're cutting in as close to the action as possible. And that's a writing technique that I've seen recommended time and time again uh, by different sources, different books, different writers. And it's one that works for certain stories, absolutely. But I am a big supporter of world building. I mean, you, you have a look at something like Lord of the Rings. Does he cut in as close to the action as possible, J.R.R.? No, I, I don't think so. I think he actually takes the time to craft a world that we understand before putting everything into disarray. And that's my own personal take on it. I love when we when there's a little bit more understanding to the proceedings, when we can appreciate the lore and the mythology a bit without having to find ourselves because we're stumbling. What's going on? Oh, okay, cool. There's no problem with it. It's just a preference, you know? That's my personal preference. There's loads of exposition dropped in throughout the first, you know, chapter, within the first few pages, no less. As Tom, the main character, he's a, he's a young boy of 15, is what he's described as. He's a third class, something they make a uh, specific reference to and mention of numerous times throughout the, the, the novel is that he was a third class, so he doesn't have all the great things that other people have because his rank is somewhat lower. Um, he sneaks out of his job at the Natural History Museum early, 
in order to witness the chase between London and the small town that it's hunting, a town called Salt Hook. And this drops us in immediately into this kind of concept of town eat town, the thrill of the hunt, the thrill of the chase, and then, of course, the capture if they're able to get them in order to strip them for parts that they as a city need. He asked permissions f- from his boss. Can he do this? Is he allowed to leave early so he can witness and get caught up in the excitement the same way that he will or and the rest of the town? He was told no. So he sneaks out. And this already gives us a good idea of the kind of character Tom is. He's a little bit of an impetuous youth. He is willing to challenge the status quo in order to to get what he wants, bend the rules a little bit because he doesn't want to miss out. It's that teenage mindset again. Um, the arrogance of youth. You know, he'll be all right. He'll be he'll be back in time. Nobody will know. Classic, really, isn't it? As as Philip continues to write, you know, we are. It's made clear that we're in a postmodern steampunk esque world. You know, it's not completely steampunk, but there's definitely a sort of vibe there where cities. Uh, exist as moving entities, as, as described on the blurb, as described earlier on, and they traverse the land on sort of like think tank-like treads and things like that, absorbing other smaller cities and towns. You know, so that if they see a smaller city, they will chase them, hunt them down, and then strip them for parts so that they could utilize them for their engine room. What happens to the people of that town? I'm not too sure. It's never made abundantly clear what the protocol is um, for this. Do they get stricken to the wastelands? Do they get uh, killed? Are they allowed to live within London? Because let's be honest, if you're on a moving city, there's only so much space within that city because you're not expanding out onto the land. You may be building up or something like that, but there's only so many homes, there's only so many jobs, there's only so much space. What do you do with the people? It's okay to consider what you do with the parts. They're just parts. But what do you do with the people? And I don't – it was only really mentioned or – um approached properly at one part later on, which we'll get to, don't worry, because you know what this thing is like. It's beat for beat, man, punch for punch. And we get a historical sort of time frame because of this. We understand where we are. We get introduced to the concept of the 60-minute war where everything changed for them. And I'll be honest, like the, the first little bit, and especially, you know, to read the synopsis, it reminds – and hey, it's been a long while since I've seen this movie, so I may be totally wrong. But I got a little vibe of uh, Howl's Moving Castle from this, if you're familiar with that movie. And on the steampunk vibe um, comparison, because one of the reasons this story first came up was when I was talking about it with Bro to Show, Johnny Mac. We were talking about steampunk, and I, I, I do quite enjoy steampunk. And I managed to find this interesting quote from, from Philip Reeve um, on the state of steampunk. And this is taken from a wonderful interview with a website called Tall Tales and Short Stories. So do check them out if you're interested. And, you know, of course, read the the full interview there. I pull a couple of quotes from that interview over the course of this review, this in-depth deep dive, should I say. And Philip has this to say on the state of steampunk, and I quote, As for the current steampunk fad for faux Victorian science fiction, that's actually the opposite of science fiction. Its fans often try to link it to Wells and Verne, but there's no real connection. Those writers understood the science of their time and extrapolated stories from possibilities which it suggested. Steampunk is all about ignoring science and pretending the Victorians could have built robots or whatever. Its look appeals to me as a setting for cartoons or lightweight comedies like Larklight, but it's really just a sort of literary dressing up box, and I'm afraid it's not a very deep one, and the costumes and props are starting to look rather threadbare. End quote. Not the most positive, glowing review for steampunk as a genre or as a category, I'm sure you can agree. Uh, and it's interesting because there are definitely sort of steampunky vibes within this. An alternate reality based off of older fashioned. Um, technology, but within a modern world, that's kind of steampunky, you know, in 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 a way, uh, you know. And this extends to, for example, like they had no concept what a CD was. They spell CD in this compact disc, S W E D Y. That's how they say it. They have no idea behind it. When Tom finds one, he's hopeful that he can play it, and it's explained that the technology just simply doesn't exist. So this is the technology of the ancestors. So we're, we're living in a world, existing in a, in a mythology where there's technology smart enough to move fucking cities that can then chase down and absorb other cities, but we have moved past the concept of CD players. That kind of jarred me a little bit unless we're to accept this concept that 
it didn't matter. That was super, superfluous technology. It was stupid to put our time and effort into something like that when we have to move. Incidentally, just as a, a, as a little aside, this concept of town eat town, uh, within the book, it's referred to as municipal Darwinism. Municipal Darwinism, right? It's an interesting term, one that's made up for the book specifically, um, but it does add, again, to the lore, to the mythology. It's quite a nice little idea that you that Philip's gone to the, the extent of creating uh, words, phrases to just drop in as though they've always existed. Because again, we're stepping into Tom's life at a point where, yeah, this, this stuff, this is all he knows. He's 15 years old. I get the impression that this is the way it's been for hundreds of years, decades, decades. So this is all people have known for a long time. It's just a part of accepted culture and language evolves in order to accommodate that. And so municipal Darwinism becomes an accepted understood term amongst all the towns and cities that are running around, rolling around, trying to fucking eat each other or hide. There's a really cool little bit here that furthers this idea of um, the historical time frame that I was mentioning earlier and how much has passed since, quote, our time where we knew what CDs were and how they work and, and now within Tom's time frame. And I quote from the book, he, that's Tom, cut through the 21st century gallery, past the big plastic statues of Pluto and Mickey, animal-headed gods of lost America, end quote. And that was a really nice visual image, I think. You know, this concept of brand mascots decaying within a museum where there's lost, you know, lost appreciation and a misunderstanding of what they were, what they represent, to the point that they thought they were anima- animal-headed totemistic gods. It's, I mean, it's one line. It's almost throwaway, but I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good way to ground us within the world that we are existing in. Now, as Tom leaves, we're really quickly introduced to a slew of major players for the story, some bigger than others, admittedly. And, uh, of course, this includes our protagonist, Tom, third class, poor, underdog, as well as a, a bully antagonist who um, – the way that he's introduced makes it seem like he's going to play a bigger part than he actually does in the overall story. Uh, his name is Herbert Melifant. A lot happens in the scene for him to run towards um, the side to be able to watch London chase down Salt Hook. But we're given some succinct world building throughout, even if the major players are introduced in a sort of broad brushstroke manner. Again, you know, this idea of Tom, he's a third, he's third class poor underdog. Those are defining traits to allow us to get to understand him on a very, very quick level. So even though there is some great world building, you look back to the animal headed gods comment, um, the characters themselves only exist as a sort of loose concept almost at this point in time. They're not defined just yet, except by obvious character traits. Now, he, Tom, ends up in a minor fist fight with Herbert, which is broken up when he encounters his boss, the one who said that he could not leave work early. That is one Chudley Pomeroy. Chudley Pomeroy. Pleasure to meet you, Chudley. Who had forbidden him from attending, as we well know. The teenage protagonist, with obstacles stacking against him, has a lot of infamiliar with YA. Popular genre right now, of course, young adult. It's really, really established itself within the marketplace over the years. But what's interesting about this, honestly, this book was originally going to be for adults. And this is actually taken, I'm going to, this was uh, taken from the British Council Literature Section website. uh, And I quote, when Philip Reeve wrote Mortal Engines, which was released in 2001, the first of his highly acclaimed and successful Hungry Cities Quartet, he did not regard it particularly as a children's book and envisioned that its readership would be early teens and upwards. Couple this with a quote from mortalengines.wikia.com, and I quote, The characters were originally going to be adults, but he later changed them to teenagers. As Philip Reeve was an illustrator when he was writing Mortal Engines, it took over six years to write between different jobs, end quote. I just added the last part in there because it makes me feel a little bit better about how long it's taking to do temporary. Those quotes, though, in conjunction with one another, paint an interesting picture because he – the book, the way it reads, the way it's written is definitely for a younger audience. There's no denying that. People's motives, their motivations, their goals are almost plainly written. There's hardly any subtlety uh, involved here. 
um, everything that they want is expressed either through literally by talking about it or kind of internally in in a character's inner monologue, which we are privy to. So there's no secrets. There's no real layers of subtlety involved. And usually that's a problem for me. But because of the kind of book that it is, I'm naturally more accepting because you have to understand what you're reading. If you pick up a mystery and you hate mysteries, well, what's the fucking point? You're just wasting your time. So with this, I was a little bit more accepting of this writing style and the way that it, it approaches it because... I was under the impression it was a children's book. Honestly, having read it, I think that it does dive a little deeper than what can traditionally be called a children's book. I actually do think that Philip Reeve was probably one of the forerunners, one of the forefathers of what is now known as young adult fiction, especially as he wrote this in 2001. I'm sure there are more, even more before that, but this certainly does not the, – the, the tone of the book, the visceral nature of how certain actions and certain events occur within its pages, I, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily put it next to a Roald Dahl book as a children's book, you know? But of course, you have to read it to find out or more importantly, listen to the rest of this review. In fact, Philip Reeve has this to say, uh, and this is taken again from uh, that same interview with Tall and Short Stories. Blogspot.co.uk. I quote: When I wrote my first novel, Mortal Engines, I was assuming that it was a grown-up science fiction novel. But when I tried to find a literary agent, there was none who was even prepared to read it, let alone represent me. So I rewrote it as a children's novel, or what they call YA these days. Uh, he goes on to say. Actually, rewriting it for a younger audience hugely improved the book, so it's not a decision that I regret, end quote. It's interesting. Uh, this is something that comes up across every single interview pretty much that I read with him is the fact that it started off one way and he had to flip it. He had to pivot. On that note, actually, it's, it's interesting. I wrote a blog post recently about the concept of pivoting. I'm a fan of a podcast called Startup. They talked about the concept of pivoting within business where you end up doing something almost totally different or subtly different to what you thought you would initially be doing. It's an interesting concept. I do recommend you go to writestevewright.com in order to read my take on the concept of pivoting and how it affects me and how it relates to temporary. Writestevewright.com. Now, Tom's punishment for sneaking out of his job early only to run into his boss is being sent to a place called The Gut. The Gut is the underbelly of London used to dismantle smaller towns that it captures. So this is like the disassembly plant, if you will. Here, he meets his own personal hero, Thaddeus Valentine, grand explorer and archaeologist extraordinaire. Always going out, out, always having adventures, writing about them, and then publishing them within London. Tom has read his books over and over again. He loves the stories, the tales, the adventure, the romance, the excitement, everything that Thaddeus calls his life. He also meets his beautiful daughter and obvious love interest in the sense that he's interested in her throughout the rest of the story and high, holds her image, her visage in high regard throughout Catherine. And there's a little exposition within this scene for us. We learn that Tom's parents were killed when a, Lon- a level of London actually fell on them, which is pretty crazy. The idea that an entire level will collapse within this moving city. Um, so that's how he lost his parents. He's an orphan, third class, as we know. And I don't know, this this felt just kind of very Bruce Wayne, Harry Potter-esque to me. Not exactly original, but at the same time, if you're going to play an orphan story, it's impossible for these two uh, poster boys, <laughs> if you will. You can't, you can't have an orphan without them being compared to these two. These are the great known orphans of the, li- the literary world. Whilst amongst the scavengers, those who are scavenging metal and taking apart the the town of salt hook valentine is attacked by a girl with a scarf around her face valentine approaches a group of people asking what they're fine he's always enjoyed this idea of being amongst not necessarily the muck but having the respect of the common man because he's unafraid to be amongst them and so they walk amongst them and it's within this group that this girl has hidden herself disguise herself with the scarf on her face amongst these burly men and when she has her opportunity she attacks a brief chase ensues as tom trying to impress both valentines gives pursuit 
He manages to corner her somewhere deep within the gut where she then takes a crossbow, a crossbow bolt to the knee or the leg. I'm not entirely sure. She takes one though and is injured. And because of this injury, she confronts him, hates him, and throws herself through an exit chute that leads out of London. Her name? Hester Shaw. Tom mentions this name to Thaddeus Valentine uh, once Valentine catches up to him as Hester recommended because she's like, you tell him Hester Shaw was here for him. And within seconds, Thaddeus has pushed Tom through the same chute that Hester just jumped down. The writing up to this point, the story plot points to get us to this moment here where Thaddeus pushes him. It's a great ramping up of intrigue and conspiracy. You know, some of the immediate questions that it left me with were, why is Hester so horribly mutilated? She pulls down her scarf at one point, and we get to see that her face is absolutely mangled with a, a scar across the majority of it at an angle. This is something that Philip never pulls back from. He's always constantly referring her to, to her as ugly, mutilated, horrendous. You know, just all these horrible adjectives to throw at a person. He uses them in describing her. And, you know, how does, how does Thaddeus Valentine tie into this? Why would he do that? Does Catherine tie in? Does she know? She wasn't present, but is she aware of what's going on? I mean, Philip Reeve has this to say on Hester's appearance. Um, because at certain points, I thought... That not not that it's harsh, but again, the language used because it it is a children's book, it, these concepts of uh, body issues and things like that don't really phase me much. But I can understand if somebody would take chagrin with it. But hey, if a person is ugly, if a person has been maimed and is now no longer um, quote unquote pretty to look at or beautiful in a traditional sense, then that's just the way of the world, man. That's the way it is. And he's within his rights to describe his own fucking character as such. In fact, let Philip say it. He says best in his own words. Again, taken from tall tales and short stories. I quote, women warriors are a bit of a cliche in science fiction and fantasy, and they tend to be very glamorous or at least good looking. But it struck me that people who live by their wits and wastelands tend not to be that glamorous or good looking. And who cares about beautiful people anyway? So I decided right from the start to make Hester ugly, and I like the idea that the hero would slowly fall in love with her anyway, which is far more interesting than having two gorgeous people seeing each other across a crowded room and falling in love, end quote. And I totally agree. It gives it this nice sort of edge to the story where uh, you get a natural sort of revenge plot. You know, why does she want Thaddeus dead? Well, he's obviously got something to do with how she is or a major part of her old life. That's why. That gives her good motivation for this. The fact that we see how ugly she is so early on and this really affects Tom, um, it, it was a good little bit of character building within such a short period of time. Again, her existence within the story so far extends to her trying to assassinate uh, Thaddeus failing and being uh, and, and jumping out the chute. Yet we already get to see her face, get to see how hideous she is. Now what's the relation here? Questions out of actions is, is great. It pushes it forward and keeps the reader engaged. I thought that was really well done, actually. Uh, and I do agree with what Philip says on the concept of, you know, women warriors, women bar barbarians tending to be very good looking or regal or something like that within this genre. So for him to actively go out of his way to not not mollycoddle or um, anything like that uh, with the audience to just make her flat ugly and memorable because of it, it is a pretty good move. Now in the out country, that's the term, that's the phrase for where they are now. They're not in London, they've fallen out of the city. They're not on the city. They're on the earth. They're within a place called the Out Country. Tom comes to terms with what's happened, trying to convince himself that he slipped. He wasn't pushed. No way was he a push. Thaddeus wouldn't do that. Or maybe he was trying to grab him to keep him safe. Anything but pushing him. Hester informs him of the truth of the situation and of her situation. Valentine killed her parents. We've got another orphan here, kids. And so Tom agrees to help her get back to London, which is interesting because, you know, if he worships Thaddeus and he's still in the process of trying to convince himself that he wasn't pushed and Thaddeus is a good guy and, oh, he's my hero, of course, why would he want to help her get to London? That's the immediate question. Why help the assassin get to her target if the target is somebody that you want to protect or look up to? 
Well, he believes that by alerting the guild of historians, that's the guild that he works for, third class, the law can then bring Valentine to justice if he's in fact guilty. He wants to do this through the process, due process with a court of law. Hester scoffs at this. Valentine, due to his high rank and how closely associated he is with so many high power people within London, well, Valentine is the law in London. There would be no due process. There would be no fair trial. And so we discover that Catherine had nothing to do with Hester. She had no idea. Valentine's actions relate only to his own personal history, which is actually intertwined with the mayor of London, Magnus Crome. The mystery of this is heightened and also spelled out for us via Catherine's inquisitive nature. Personally, I found this to be a little bit lazy, uh, lazy writing in theory. Um, But actually, honestly, it's appropriate for the younger target demographic. Writing for children, these things need to be spelt out. I mentioned this earlier. And once I adjusted to understanding the core audience for this book, things like this where they're, they're just completely made apparent. There's no subtlety. Characters speak their mind. And, you know, just things like that. You get to accept a lot more. and You can enjoy it for what it is. At first, though, I did consider it to be kind of lazy to have somebody – to have one of the characters spell out so obvious for us. During their time together, Tom and Hester uh, trying to trudge back towards London, which is quickly leaving them in the dust, we get exposition and character development for Hester. We get to understand her better past, oh, she's an ugly assassin. We discover that her parents found a device called Medusa. Valentine wanted it and killed them for it assuming that he had finished off Hester as well whilst doing the deed. And there are interesting themes actually tackled here for a book that is still considered to be for children. You know, uh, concepts of survivor's guilt allows Tom to develop an understanding with her. And this is the first time that we have a form, a bond between the two, one that is early friendship because it's an empathetic and sympathetic understanding of where she's coming from. She's an orphan too. I'm an orphan. She lost her parents. I lost her parents. uh, Sorry, I lost my parents. Mine was an accident. Hers were murdered. But for the first time since they met in the circumstances that they did, he gets to understand why she would want Valentine killed if this was true. And the survivor's guilt. Why did I survive? Why did my parents have to die? Why am I still here? What does that mean? I hate that I'm still here. I hate that I'm not the one they deserve to be alive. Survivor's guilt is a unifier between the two of them. It's an interesting one to be explored, incidentally. Tom and Hester are drugged by some traveling small town. This is how we move them forward uh, faster. They encounter a small town. They think they can trust them. And they're drugged by the mayor of it, the leader of it, who would then attempt to sell them as slaves at the sort of slave fair. They escape this horrible situation with the help of an oriental woman named Fang who um, just from her very introduction, you know that Fang is going to be a popular and important character to the story. And there's an interesting cut to moment at the end of one chapter. And this, this is to do with the writing style. And I found it so interesting that I needed to make a note of it because, again, it's not right. It's not wrong. This is a published, well-regarded book. But in my writing, in the feedback I received from... Uh, in a very early draft of temporary, I was told to do something like this is is quote wrong. You know that that is how it was phrased. It's how it was. I was definitely made to feel this cut to moment at the end of one chapter where we're suddenly rooted with a character called Shrike, and Shrike is the cyborg assassin that the mayor of London Chrome sends after Tom and Hester in order to finish them off, make sure there are no survivors, if you will. And this paragraph, this. As information from Shrike's perspective, not only is it written all in italics, it's a solo paragraph, it's very film-esque, which is another no-no. That's the no-no I was once informed of. I personally don't believe it. I don't subscribe to it. I mentioned this in my um, deep dive of Star Wars Aftermath written by Chuck Wendig, which you can go back and check out if you want to. All the old uh, episodes are there ready for you to to download and enjoy. Um, I don't believe in that, though. That you can't have that sort of film inspiration where you can cut to different scenes and be rooted with different people if it helps for the story. But it'll always stick with me, obviously. That's now part of my my writer makeup where somebody told me that this isn't what you should do. 
but I don't I don't agree with that. And it's my right to disagree, just like it's his right or her right to or your right to 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 think that they, that is the way because you're wanting to read a book, not a movie. But how can you experience things from so many different angles to further the story without doing this? Philip Reeve has this to say on the Mortal Engines writing style, and this is taken from an interview with a website called 19questions.com, and I quote, When I started writing Mortal Engines, it really was because I didn't have the means to put it on film. There's always a very strong visual element to my stuff. Most of my books are basically me describing a movie which I'm screening in my head, end quote. I love that because that I, I definitely subscribe to that level that that way of thinking. Even if it is something that was poo pooed by the guy that reviewed my manuscript or the early version of it, should I say? Because it's, it's evolved and grown so much since then. And this is the thing when it comes to critical feedback off of any of your personal work, you got to take it through a filter of that is that person's opinion through their own personal filter. It is up to you whether you listen or not. Take what you need, leave what you don't, and just grow with it. You know. But considering this, considering this sort of filmic style of putting down scenes from his head onto paper, how does this – how does he approach writing as a whole? An interview with a website, natashangan.com, she queried uh, him on this and she asked him, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? Do you go out of your way in order to make lots of plot points and then thread them together to understand how the story is going? Or do you sit down and start hammering at a keyboard and see what comes out and then make coherent sense out of it as you go edit by edit? And Philip had this to say, quote, Pantser for sure. I never plot anything out in advance. I usually have an opening image in mind and a couple of ideas for things that might happen further down the line. And then I just start writing and see where it goes. Usually when I'm about two-thirds of the way through the first draft, I start to understand what it's about and what the ending will be. Sometimes I get an idea for a whole story, but there's, that's always a disaster. I never bother finishing those. Writing is boring if you know what's going to happen next. End quote. I don't necessarily agree with every part of what he has to say, but there is, there is some words of wisdom within there. But I just think that's, that's interesting. It's an interesting way to go because I'm definitely I'm more of a plotter than a pantser personally. Um, but there are elements where, I, you know, during the writing process where I'll sit down and just see what comes up, how I can thread it together. If it works, great. If not, throw it away, start again or uh, rewrite it, edit it. Writing is rewriting after all. Hashtag rewrite club. All about the rewrite club. Too sweet. Now, it's with Fang's help. Remember the Oriental woman they met? That they arrive at a place called Air Haven. Now, the easiest way that I could describe this to you, think of it like a steampunk, a uh, cloud city in Star Wars. Now, it isn't long, of course, until Shrike tracks them down and things just start to explode all around them. It's just madness. Tom pisses his pants. Fair enough, really. Uh, but they make a point of this during the writing that he happens to piss his pants. And I'll be completely honest right now. I can't recall a single sentence or paragraph in which these pants get changed. I don't. I don't. I really don't. I'm unsure if the rest of the story is with piss, uh, piss uh, riddled pants. This dried and awkwardly smelly and stinking weird and stuff. I don't know. I can't remember. He might have done. Hey, man. You know, he might have done. I just didn't happen to pick it up on it. But here, you know, Hester commandeers a hot air balloon to allow them to escape Sans Fang. They get out by themselves, leaving her with her compatriots. You know, she met one of her friends, a fellow captain, uh, an African character uh, in in one of the bars there before Shrike comes back and just levels everything, making – just creating hell, this cyborg bounty hunter. There is something that I wanted to highlight here, but not not in a shitty way. I just it make it's, it's it's a comforting thing. It doesn't make me feel good, but it's a comforting thing that in this version of the book, a fifteenth anniversary version of Mortal Engines, there's a typo. I quote within the book: "He only wanted stuff he could he could sell." End quote. Again, it's not in a shitty way to, to highlight it or just be like, ha-ha, look at this, how dumb, because there have been typos in other books too. But the fact that this is a 15th anniversary version of it and typos still managed to slip through and get through is just comforting as, as somebody that's putting so much pressure on themselves to try and get their manuscript as perfect as possible. The fact that such a well-regarded book and a multiple award-winning novel could have a mistake like this just kind of puts puts my – mind at ease a little bit helps me get out of my own mind a little bit just calm down and um again 
go back to fear is the mind killer. You know, people make mistakes, mistakes do happen, but the strength of the story is what matters. We get a flashback now to when Shrike actually rescued Hester, and this helps to set up exposition and the history that exists between the two of them. Intriguing as to why this would be, considering as a cyborg, he's meant to not have feelings. This is one of the reasons that they were first developed out of the, the dead soldiers that they were that they were the basis for. When, when the cyborgs were first created, what they were doing was resurrecting dead soldiers as cyborgs in, in order to keep fighting the same battle, much like in the episode uh, Infernal Devices, the Doctor Who story I reviewed. So why the emotional attachment? Why is Shrike emotionally attached to Hester in any way? If that's meant to be a, a core contributing thing that makes him human that's no longer there, it's meant to be gutted out of him. Shrike chases them, so they ditch the hot air balloon. He's in his own ship, and they're on course, following them no matter where they go. And he traverses back over the out country after London, as Shrike continues his pursuit of the balloon, believing them to be aboard. Because what they do is they outsmart him, or so they think. They come down below the clouds, jump off where they can, and let the balloon rise back up. Meanwhile, Shrike, simply seeing the balloon, assumes they're still aboard and follows it, eventually, of course, discovering that they're not within it. Now, I pulled a quote from the book here um, on Chrome. That's the mayor of London. When he looks upon Catherine, who's currently investigating Hester and the connection she has to her father, that's the way that this book is really broken down, is in between Tom and Hester and Catherine's investigative journal, uh, journalism, if you will, just trying to find out the truth behind the situation. And I quote, He smiled faintly, like somebody who had never seen a smile, but had read a book on how to do it. End quote. I just thought it was a good piece of writing. Uh, I really enjoyed that line. It really gets across a lot about Chrome and his disassociation and disconnect, how almost robotic he is in himself despite being human. With that, we move back to Shrike and his pursuit of Hester and Tom. He knew that the balloon was empty. He knew it. He's a cyborg. He's got uh, infrared eyes that he was able to click into and see that it was empty and he saw them move away. But, and it's described in the book as such, he's so impressed with her thinking that he decides that he would let her live if only for a little longer. That's the mindset that this cyborg has. Good idea. You deserve to live a little longer. So he sends his own crew on a fucking goose chase for something that he knew was empty all along. A little bit weird again, considering he's not meant to have that emotional attachment. His programming is obviously slightly wrong. Either that or his... His attachment to her is so powerful, it reminds him how to feel. I think that's the vibe that we're meant to be going for. It's, 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 it's familial, you know, father-daughter-esque is how we're meant to be looking towards their relationship. So he tracks them down, and during the moment of confrontation, during the moment, no less, of confrontation, a high drama moment as he's finally about to cut them down and take in his bounty, he is crushed literally out of the blue by a runaway town, which is closely followed by another slightly larger suburb as they, you know, he's chasing them and Tom and Hester hitch a ride with the larger town only to discover that it's a pirate suburb, which is a cool idea. Now, the way that they punk out Shrike, I'm not so happy with. Um, the idea that they wouldn't see uh, even a small town trundling along at high speeds towards them within what is meant to be a desolate wasteland of sorts is somewhat unbelievable. Uh, I mean, how do you not see that coming towards you? On top of which, he's a cyborg, so he's got cybernetic components. He should be able to surely jump or roll out the way or leap far enough to be able to get out of harm's way. But as it plays out, he's just standing there and then out of nowhere, he just gets smashed into of course, he's not dead, as uh, our main characters believe, um, because we cut back to him. And as a further interesting note to Shrike's um, paragraphs, as to, to Shrike's moments in the book, all of his perspective is not only written in italics, as I already mentioned, it's actually written in a third-person present tense versus the common third-person past tense of Tom and Catherine. I just found this really interesting because I couldn't really understand why the tense shift has happened here. It's too consistent to be a mistake, but at the same time, I, I don't understand the, the need for it. It doesn't add anything. It certainly doesn't take anything away apart from being a little bit confusing um, as things happen in the past for Tom and everyone else, and yet in the present for Shrike, I, I just didn't, I just, I couldn't grasp the need for it or the why. That was a little bit frustrating because of it, I can't lie. Now, we're back with Catherine as she continues her investigation, 
and she descends once more deep into the underbelly. She descends back into the gut in order to interview the engineer who happened to witness what happened between her father, Hester, and Tom. There was only one person there that saw or supposedly saw everything, and at once – the events occurred, he quickly moved away. He escaped the situation because he didn't want to be uh, fingered in that way. Like, oh, he could tell you everything. Now, I have issues not necessarily with the scene, but with the character of Catherine because of this scene. It's her first trip away from her life of privilege by herself, although she takes her wolf, who they ironically call Dog, uh, down with her in order to keep her protected. Now, Dog is with her throughout. He really is a safety blanket for her. And it, like I say, it's her first trip away from her life of privilege, deep into the reality of what helps the city run. And I can't stress it enough. This is the reality that her and the upper class are completely blind to or choose to turn a blind eye to because they don't like the reality of it. She phrases it as such. She says, quote, I have come down to the sunless country, she thought. Oh, Cleo, this is the land of the dead. End quote. The land of the dead. This is where people are working to help your fucking city run. And one of the things that she actually detests so greatly, as described by one of the characters who are giving her a little bit of a minor tour, they're using human excrement, shit, if you will, um, and turning it into fuel. Now, you have workers working within the tanks of it. Sure, that's not necessarily hygienic, but the concept, the idea, the resourcefulness to turn excrement into fuel to allow the city to continue running, well, that's pretty fucking resourceful. That's, that's actually pretty smart, and people should be commended for that. Somebody's got to do it, right? Not so sure on turning it into a, quote, tasty snack, though, which is something that they suggested. And they actually have a little throwback to that later on, which I thought was pretty funny. I noticed that. It's pretty subtle. But I don't know. I just did not like Catherine during this scene. Rather, I mean, she's horrified by the working conditions, but more so, she seems to be more horrified by the fact that this is what's actually happening. This is how the, ton is, the town is run. Well, sweetheart, you got to wake up. I know you might wish the town is run on unicorn farts, but that's just not simply how it goes. And so for you to have engineers and scientists to be able to figure out how to turn shit into fuel, that's pretty lucky. That's a pretty good situation to be in, making London a powerful town within the, 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 the spectrum they exist within. Now we're back with Tom and Hester in trouble, in a net, problematic here. But it turns out, of course, that Hester knows the mayor of the pirate suburb. How handy is that? The impression I got from this is the mayor was friends with Shrike or knew her through Shrike when she was a girl growing up. And so they go way back. And he only agrees to free her on Tom's behest, wanting to impress him, considering him to be a, quote, fine London gentleman. And it's only because of this, his impression of what Tom is, that he frees Tom. And then Tom makes the, the issue, please free her. And so she gets freed too. His wish, the mayor, is to turn his pirate suburb into a respectable city. And he wants Tom's help to teach himself and his crew polite manners of higher society. He aims for something better than himself. He's got ambition to better himself as a person and in turn his entire uh, town. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's certainly not necessarily uh the actions or the motivations of a, of a reprobate pirate although don't get me wrong he's certainly got a lot of negative qualities extending to how he treats his family catherine meets with pod beavis pod is the name of the uh, engineer that witnessed what happened that fateful night so recently and she meets up with him in a sort of coffee shop or a diner in order to interrogate him a little bit to grill him uh, so that he can reveal what he saw that night. She implores him to assist her in gaining entrance to the guild leaders meeting that night at the uh, Engineerium, where they get where they'll be discussing this weapon, this 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 machine, Medusa. Now it's all caps, Medusa. Never find out what that's an acronym for, but it seems like it is one. Found in America, by the way, the, the desert plains of a uh, lost, broken America, Medusa. Also, during this time, everything goes into a state of disarray because another, bigger city is on the horizon. And it's actually a city that is 
uh, multiple cities connected into an even larger monstrosity. And it's got its sights set and it is making a beeline towards trundling London town, ready to ingest it, causing riots, panic and uproar amongst the citizens and amongst the streets. Fair enough, really, because here you thought you are a, a powerful city able to take out smaller ones and now you are the prey. It's a town eat town world. And we learn about something called the K-Department. The K-Department, they do research that it's suggested revolves around creating new cyborgs. So if an engineer dies, or if somebody dies within the gut, they can be resurrected to continue working ad nauseum forever and ever and ever, for free, without the need for rest or food, slaves to the system for those in charge. Now the pirate mayor leads his city, known as Tunbridge Wheels, and there's a there's a ton of little puns like this throughout the entire book. Um, you just got to keep an eye out for it. There's a meatloaf reference in there, uh, a couple of things like that, things that would definitely be overlooked and underappreciated or unappreciated entirely by the young fan base that this seems to be catered towards. Now, for fathers or mothers that happen to be reading this to their, their kids – They'll, they'll get a little chuckle out of it and their kid will probably look at them and go, what's funny? And then they'll have that little moment of you'll find out when you're older or whatever it happens to be. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of little puns going throughout this book. So the pirate mayor leads Tunbridge Wheels towards the fallen air haven. That's their intended goal. It's smoking away in the distance, a plunder ready for the taking, intending to pick it apart for, for parts, for spare parts, for money, for jewels, for gold, for whatever they want. And this is, of course, after already taking over that other city that they were chasing, which, incidentally, in order to answer the question that I posed earlier, what do they do with the people? Well, I don't know if this is what London does, but Tunbridge Wheels murdered every last person that they didn't need or want, just straight death. And that's pretty dark. That's pretty grim that life can be so cheap out in these wastelands. The Jenny Hanover, which is Fang's ship, ambushes them ambushes the Tunbridge wheels and sinks them, sinks the pirate ship under the attack. They escape on a rubber inflatable dinghy, courtesy of the mayor. That's, that's, that's Hester and Tom. And in doing so, the mayor walks past his young family, allowing them to die. He completely ignores them. They're completely trapped by fear, frozen, unsure what to do, directionless. And he, in his effort to keep himself alive, his priority is rescuing Tom. He prefers him and what he can offer him himself in order to better himself as a person, a means of escape, leaving his family, of which there's quite a few daughters and sons, to die a horrible drown drowning death. Once they've escaped, he attempts to then lead them into battle, of all things. Like, even though most of his crew is dead, there's a ragtag bunch of pirates still left, and you've got the smoking remnants of Airhaven uh, ahead of you, ready to be plundered, he still wants to lead them into battle. And he quickly finds himself trapped in a quagmire. A literal one, not a, a rhetorical one. He's stuck in, like, quicksand. In this mud. Every time he struggles... He sinks a little bit faster. And it's this moment when he turns to them and asks for help that his crew turn on him. One of them shoots him dead as he slowly sinks into the mud, which, and this is a direct quote from the book, which again really highlights the core audience that it's for. I was not a fan of this per se. Uh, it did make me laugh though. The, the quote, the mud gulped him down with soft farting noises. End quote. Yeah, fart, farting noises. That's the best way to get that across. Um, that's probably one, during one of those redrafts, re-edits to make it more for kids because you could describe it in a million different ways. But to use, to use the term farting noises to make it instantly relatable, you can definitely tell who that's aimed for. The engineering meeting, remember this, this meeting of the, of the guilds within London to decide what to do, ends with a demonstration of Medusa. As this other great city is heading towards them, they are in council discussing what to do with Medusa. And Catherine still refuses to believe her father has any part to play in this. As she and Pod, that's Beavis Pod, remember, disguised as guild members with hoods up, collars up, etc., manage to infiltrate the meeting. They've got little guild symbols 
painted onto their foreheads in between their eyebrows. Um, the real guild members have them tattooed as a rite of passage, I imagine, uh, and also to differentiate what guild they're associated with and what their knowledge base is, is, is a part of, or based in. But this bothers me a little bit, but only, only a little bit, because again, you got to keep bringing it back around about the core demographic. Even though this book was originally written for adults, it did go through, I imagine, multiple redrafts to uh, change that key core audience to children. And that's why the disguises work, despite them being children themselves. They're only 15 or so. I imagine Pod might be a little bit older, but Catherine is about the same age as Tom, or so I'm led to believe, or I imagine is the case. They're all teenagers regardless. And so for them to have this work so flawlessly, I found a little hard to believe. But again, that's trying to pick holes in a story where I'm suspending my sense of disbelief for towns that move and eat other towns. You know, you're splitting hairs here and there. But within that same mythology on that same note, I can buy into that. But this I just found a little bit weird. Fair enough, though. More, more power to you. It's a kid's book. In theory. Again, I still think this should be recategorized and... and and, and place with the other young adult novels within the bookstores. Shrike, who's still alive, remember, if you call the cyborg uh, maybe a living death, if you will, or, you know, uh, animated life, he comes along and he kills the remaining pirates who had turned on Hester and Tom with the mayor of Tundridge Wheels, PV dead. He comes in to make the rescuing save for them. And he reveals his wish, his motivation, one of the reasons that he took the job in order to hunt them down. The one thing Chrome said he would grant him in return for dealing with these two. Chrome would turn Hester into a cyborg, and then together they would have hunted down Valentine in order to exact revenge. He wanted to have Hester as his daughter forever. Gutted out, emotionless, if you will, like him. And yet, at the same time, that's a that's an, a motivation and an ambition driven purely by emotion to want to stay with somebody forever. In that again, that familial context, father and adopted daughter, it would be sweet in a way if it wasn't so fucking twisted. Tom, who's clutching a dead pirate sword, stabs Shrike through in an attempt to save Hester, who claims that she hates him for interfering once more. Because the life of a cyborg, to her apparently, wasn't that bad an idea. She was actually quite enticed by the concept of it. She's already ugly physically. She feels ugly. So allow her to exist only within a metal shell. And she could have perhaps found happiness, especially over the body of Thaddeus Valentine. And of course, Tom strikes him through as he's distracted with Hester. The only reason he's able to get in to get that killing blow. Pomeroy helps Catherine. Do you remember Chudley? Chudley Pomeroy helps Catherine and Pod hide in his bug as they escape from the engineering once they've been found out. Because of course they do get found out. And all hell breaks loose as they attempt to escape barely with their lives. Bumping into Pomeroy outside and, and, and him agreeing to hide them within his bug. Delivering them back home safely is St. Paul's Cathedral, which is at the top tier, at the very top of this moving London town, opens up and Medusa fires what I can only imagine is like a condensed, powerful laser beam and destroys the uncommon attacker in one fell blow. People all around them cheer and celebrate because here we are is no longer a town eight town world. London will become the superpower with Medusa's help because even larger cities can't hope to compete with the power that Medusa has. So people cheer and they celebrate in the streets as Catherine simply looks on at the destruction aghast. And thus ends part one of Mortal Engines. Picking up in part two, Fang helps to secure Tom and Hester's safety against the cleanup crew uh, from the Jenny Hanover as well as Air Haven. She intends to take them to a major city on the other side of the shield wall to warn that city of London and its Medusa weapon and how dangerous it is. And the fact that the end goal 
is for them to break through the shield wall in order to feast on all of these static cities, these cities that have stayed rooted and decided to build a wall to protect themselves rather than lift up and become part of this municipal Darwinism that all these other cities and towns have uh, become a part of. Again, the writing tense constantly switches. In London, everything seems to be written in a third-person present and then switching to Catherine or Tom because past. It's an odd choice. Uh, I, I put down here in my notes, it's an odd choice if it is a choice. I, am, I, I imagine it was a choice. I don't see a first-time author or um, even the publishing company allowing this to slip through without that being a decision that's been made. I mean, honestly, on that point, I have this quote from Philip Reeve here. I'm talking about not having any formal training in writing. And this is taken once again from the Tall Tales and Short Stories interview. He says this, quote, I've mentioned the trouble I had trying to find an agent to represent mortal age engines, but I've been pretty lucky, really. The first publisher who read it accepted it. I've had no formal training at all, unless you count school. He then goes on to say, I suppose I've improved over the years by reading and watching other people's stories and noticing how they do things, end quote. So I suppose it's not out of the realm of possibility that this tense switching is a mistake. I just don't believe that it is. I think it was a choice. I just don't understand the reason behind the choice, and I think that's the most frustrating part of it. Once, once you notice it, it's just there. You can't unnotice it. It's very frustrating because of it. Now... Upon arrival to the great city Batmonk Gompa, and I hope I'm saying that right, I'm not entirely sure, um, Tom, Hester, Fang, they all attend a meeting with the city's leaders and their council, where Fang suggests actually attacking London before it can get in range in order to do, do, to do damage. Tom is enraged by this because he was under the impression that they were there to simply evacuate the city, to warn them of the oncoming London so they can move. He develops, actually, whilst being in the city, a little bit of a um, an appreciation for what the city is and the static nature of their, of their livelihood. He's never thought of life outside of London. All he's ever known is moving cities. So everything else to him is either antiquated or stupid. But here he is actually within another culture, having the kind of adventure he's always fantasized about and having an appreciation for it that he never thought he'd have. He's growing as a character because of this. Tom leaves the meeting after an outburst and a confrontation, and, and he follows a monk dressed in red. This monk stands out to him to, for some reason, you know. Even though all the monks wear red, they, something about this one particular guy. And he discovers that it is, of course, Thaddeus Valentine in disguise. Thaddeus had taken the 13th floor elevator, that's his own personal airship, away from London in order to uh, do some research. So everything that's been happening on London has been going on in the onset as Thaddeus has been away. Catherine learns the truth about Hester at this point and her unfortunate, horrible connection to her father. The Pandora Shaw, that's the name of the research assistant that was helping her father, that's Hester's mother. She found earlier evidence that could have pointed towards the two of them, but she didn't make the connection at that point, even though it was pretty obvious for everybody else. And we discovered that she had a connection with her father as his assistant before she was married, at which point her name changed. Tom follows Hester and Fang, who hunt down Valentine as he sets a fire within their air fleet, crippling their defenses, crippling their offenses before a London attack. They now can't do anything. Valentine has infiltrated this city perfectly, flawlessly, with an extreme um, callousness, calculated, cold, effective. Tom actually wants to let Hester go alone during this point. It's worth pointing out. It's a really weird... A really weird point because he's, he's becoming a hero. He's accepting this role even if he's not aware of it. And at this point, there's a real moment of, of actual cowardice where he sees Hester wanting to follow the action, wanting to confront Valentine, uh, assist Fang, and he wants to turn back before the exit gets blocked off. Well, that's exactly what happens. And now he's forced to follow Hester. What a hero. Right, guys? I mean, the actual way it's written is, quote, I'm not following her in there, he thought. 
If she wants to get herself trapped and roasted, that's her lookout, end quote. So literally, he's just like, well, if you want to get yourself killed, that's your decision. I want to live, so I'm going to go this way. Again, it's perhaps a moment of cowardice, but it's one that you can't really blame him for. A survival instinct kicks in. He wants to live, so he's going the other way. See where those people are fighting amongst flame and fire as everything burns down around them? I'm going to go the other way. Can't blame him. <laughs> really, it's kind of a smart thought, even if he is abandoning his friends in order to do it. Fang, who is anti-tractionist, incidentally, I mean, that, that, that was a supposedly big reveal that, that shook his belief in her because he thought that she was on his side and uh, it's later revealed that she does not believe in the traction, the moving cities, and is a part of a culture that wants to see that end, the rebels, if you will. And that, that conflicts him a little bit further. It's a nice little element that plays into their relationship here. Fang, during the fight with Valentine, is killed. Stabbed through after being distracted by the 13th elevator's lights after it burst through the ceiling, blinding her. In a pretty awesome fight scene, the writing of this is actually pretty good. It's bloody, it's visceral, it's in close. You get a real sense of what's going on and the effort being put forth. It's a fight for survival. Once Fang is killed, Hester and Tom make a break for it. They can't do anything to help her at this point, unfortunately. Their friend, who they then doubted, who they then accepted who that she was because again tom's reality is expanding what he thought he knew isn't all that he knows now he's learned better he learned he's learned more about the world around him as opposed to his ancillary world of just london together they travel to the jenny hanover fang's ship after he lifts the key from fang's body around her neck a, in, in, intending to travel back to london in order to finish off valentine who has since escaped upon the very uh, airship, the 13th elevator, that blinded Fang, that led to her death. Now, I'll be honest, I've got two major issues with this. I'll list them out for you here. One, quote, You have gone funny, said Hester, but she came with him anyway, helping him find a way back through the shield wall while soldiers came running past them. End quote. Really? Really? Two teens walking away from two corpses and no soldiers who were rushing past them decide to stop them in order to interrogate them or ask them any questions or even just detain them for a short period of time because they clearly have something to do with the two corpses that they're running towards. That makes no sense. There's a fundamental disconnect of logic at this point. Even if there is fire going around in panic, you would think, hey, uh, yeah, everything's ablaze. There are two people dead over there and two teenagers leaving. Uh, yeah, I'll just let them go. No, it, that doesn't really hold water. Two, and this one really, really bothers me, and this is during their escape scene aboard the Jenny Hanover. Quote, Tom nodded. I used to build model airships when I was little, so I understand the principle. End quote. Yes, Tom. That makes you more than qualified to pilot a fucking aircraft. The fact that you used to build model airships so you have a concept and understanding to the principle of flying them. Building a little model is not the same as being inside a cockpit looking at all the delicate instruments that involve flying a machine thousands of miles in the air. Explain it away, if you will, by saying, oh, but it's a kid's book. These two bits are by far the largest fundamental disconnect of logic within this book. Catherine confronts her father upon his return to London. There's some big character flaw and inconsistencies that occur here, as well as a pretty ill-fitting twist, in my opinion. Something that just seems completely crowbarred in, and I'm not happy with that. I, I mean, I just don't think it really flowed. But this does tie in with the way that he writes, the, the pantsing nature of it, that, um, Philip Reeve puts his hands up and admits to. Valentine has this to say to Catherine, and I quote, She was a pretty child. This, this, incidentally, this is him talking about Hester when he met her when she was a child after he cut down her parents. She was a pretty child. She was about your age, and she looked so like you that she might have been your sister. Perhaps she was your sister. Pandora and I were very close at one time. End quote. Really? 
Really? Throw in a familial connection at this point between some up to this point completely disconnected characters. There have been no hints at all about them being related or being connected outside of this. I could buy into Valentine cutting down two people, one of whom was his old research assistant, because she took the key to Medusa when she went back to America, which has enabled them to weaponize this weapon of mass destruction. That's essentially what it is. Um, I could buy into that. I could even buy into them being, quote-unquote, close at one time. But, I mean, Tom Tom has been holding Catherine in such high regard throughout, fantasizing about her, putting her on a pedestal, admiring how beautiful she is, and especially in relation to how repulsive he finds um, Hester. But at no point has he ever kind of ever made this sort of connection where he's like, oh, they kind of look alike. Maybe they look alike because I guess it's like looking at a funhouse mirror version of Catherine – she looks so like you that she might have been your sister. Perhaps she was your sister. Now, if he's got such a Jones in for Catherine, you would have thought that maybe he could be like, oh, on an odd occasion, she kind of did look like nothing like that. No connection point just dropped in out of the blue. And that is why I don't like it because it's just so left field, this connection. And now they're family, stepsisters. Ugh, no, I, I didn't dig that. I have to be honest. A twist for a twist's sake is not a worthy twist. It's just random and sporadic. Catherine, in her confrontation with her father, has this to say, quote, We will have to go on as we always have, chasing and eating. And if we meet a bigger city and get eaten ourselves, well, even that would be better than being murderers, she says, end quote. Okay, Catherine, sit down. I think you're going to need to, to be seated for this because a precedent has already been set regarding this. Other people are left to die or, as with the pirates, are simply killed. Um, the impression that I got, again, is that people don't just assimilate. This has never been stated one way or the other, I don't believe, hence my initial um, how open-ended I left it at the beginning. But <laughs> by this point of the book, it becomes kind of clear. You know, they, they don't just accept an influx of new people wanting to immigrate onto their city just because they've destroyed their city. They don't assimilate. They would either be left in the wastelands to die or are killed. This is another example of Catherine being completely naive as a character, and it's, it's an ignorant, actually, to, to the reality of what's happening, and it's kind of frustrating because of it. She is a difficult character to really connect with. She, her heart's in the right place. That much is clear. The fact that she tries to track down and understand as well as she does by the end is ad admirable, but her fundamental failings are just in a complete ignorance, a childlike ignorance. I suppose you can play it as if it's, it's not her fault because that's the world she was brought up in, shrouded and, and completely sheltered uh, by her father. I mean, it's worth mentioning that, you know, her father was not a rich man at first. It was because of the discovery of the Medusa that he was able to attain a higher rank and thus a better life for them both. So he's desperate to keep that for her, which gives him impetus and reason behind some of his actions, which is good. It's great that he has motivation as a quote unquote bad guy. Maleficent, the bully boy from the start, if you remember, who had been demoted to third class, eavesdrops on Catherine and Pod, who, pla who they plan to plant a bomb in order to destroy Medusa. I mean, talk like that, they're terrorists at this point. They're the rebel alliance, you know? They also happen to share a kiss. So take that, Tom. In the time that you've been away pining after her, she's hooked up with Pod. This guy who she's seen in the drudgery of the gut, the underbelly, and she's fallen for that bit of rough, that rough boy with the, the troubled eyes. Not really. I mean, Todd, Pod comes across like a really nice guy, um, even though that's supposedly odd within an engineer's mindset. That's something they actually touch upon within the book. Melephant rats them out to the mayor who sends his boys around within the engineer uh, guild, killing Dog in the process that wolf that's kept her protected for so long. And the way they do it is so blunt. It's just a bullet to the head or something like that, and he's dead. He's gone. And it's it's only nice because it shows that they mean business. Uh, it's a shame to see the wolf die, honestly, but it works at that story point, point, as a plot point. Much in the same way as they did with Fang, the drama is heightened because of this because she's now lost something that means so much to her. And it highlights to us as an audience, they mean business. Blood has been spilled. A big shootout happens in the museum now between the Guild of Historians and the Guild of Engineers. 
uh, the historians win this battle utilizing old equipment like blunderbusses and stuff like that uh, in order to help Catherine and Pod with their plan because they don't want the art, the culture of other places to be destroyed by London's weapon of mass destruction, Medusa. Quote, There'll be a guard on the elevators and more security men here any minute. Stalkers too, probably. End quote. Um, this is in, in their escape plans from, from the museum, incidentally. I, I just found this interesting because considering that stalkers haven't supposedly existed for hundreds of years, we, we learned that during the course of the book with the mythology, everyone seems very accepting of cyborg, cyborg warriors now. Like very, very easy to adapt and be like, cool, they've not existed forever. There was that secret K department that was making them, but nobody knew about them. And now we know cyborgs are here and we're just going to accept this. I think maybe there would have been a little bit more reaction to that, especially shock or surprise. But hey, okay, whatever. We're, we're near. We're, we're quickly amping up the pace at the end of the book. It's, it's one line. I just found it a little bit odd that everybody's so quick to accept. Yes, yeah, stalkers are back. Tom, meanwhile, is engaged in a dogfight with the thirteenth floor elevator whilst driving uh, or piloting, should I say, the Jenny Hanover. Sans Valentine, who's still in London, of course, his two henchmen are piloting the thirteenth floor elevator. Now, again, with no official pilot training, with no formal training whatsoever outside of building fucking models, he's able to bring it down by shooting rockets not at the armored sides, by, but by targeting the windows that hold the crew members, the two men that are in there. As he brings it down, the 13th floor elevator crashes into the engineerium near one of the top tiers of London. The 13th elevator smashes into London. In the direct area that Pod and Catherine are in, are in, amongst the revelers and partygoers who are there waiting for Medusa to fire. Incidentally, as a little side note, they're serving these little brown appetizers and entrees that apparently taste quite funny, which I think is a nice little throwback to trying to turn shit into a delectable treat. Pod is killed in a visceral fashion during this scene. And it's a bit of a shame to see him go because the romance has been blossoming between him and Catherine, two people from two different levels of society. I was buying into that. It was a nice little um, organic love that was just building out of nowhere. And it's a shame to see it end the way that it does. And it ends like this, and I quote, He was lying broken in a steep angle of the debris. Twisted in such impossible ways that Catherine knew at once there was no point even calling out his name. End quote. This also happened after Pod had just shared that he loved her. Drama, drama, drama. Oh, sweet drama. I can only being, imagine being like 12 years old and reading that and be like, oh my god, this is the most romantic thing I've ever read. And oh shit, he's fucking dead? What? Tears, man. Tears could have rolled at this point. The final build-up to the end, at this point, it really finds its pacing. I have to admit, Philip Reeve has a good idea of the overall pace of this. Um, the book itself isn't the longest book in the world, but the chapters are really, really short. They Again, it ties into this concept that it almost feels like a film, like what he talked about. And it really finds its pacing because of it. As we have little cut scenes going one from one to the other. And it races along as all of our heroes converge upon London with a shared unified purpose. Stop Medusa. Or in some place, stop Medusa slash kill Valentine. But they all have that same common denominator now. Despite being separated by hundreds of miles maybe. It's a good way to bring them all back together. Hester, in her attempts to track down Valentine, is taken prisoner and is brought up to Chrome and a conflicted Valentine inside the Engineerium as Medusa begins to power up. Valentine, upon seeing a ghost of his past, somebody he thought he cut down forever ago as a child. Can you imagine that? Thinking that you've murdered a child only for her horrible, horrible, twisted visage to come up again and confront you 15 or so years later. So what he does, he attempts to finish the job. It's pretty cold, man, honestly. Catherine runs between them and saves Hester, taking the blade that is intended for her, shocking them all. Her body lands on a machine nearby and accidentally inputs a series of incorrect data and codes, causing the power to build up within London with no way to escape through Medusa. And this leads to a critical overload. 
Looking up, they spot the Jenny Hanover and attempt to escape through the top of St. Paul's. Everything's going to shit at this point. Everything's really picking up the pace. Hester boards the Jenny Hanover and turns and sees that Catherine has died in her, their, father's arms. Upon Valentine's behest, she boards and they leave them as London is engulfed in explosion and flame. They die as Tom and Hester fly away, unsure of where to go next. Which is a pretty heavy, dour ending. I'm sure you can agree. I mean, at this point, Hester is unaware of the relation between them. I don't know if she'll ever find out. I've only read the first book out of a potential, uh, out of the four. But Catherine taking the blade, killing her off near the end, adds a, a great twist, a great surprise. Whereas before, there was that twist that was crowbarred in for the twist's sake. Here you have a character who's understood the truth of the situation and feels that the only way to remedy this is to save the girl that didn't deserve to die in the first place. And so Valentine loses the one thing that he's done this all for in the first place as well. He loses his daughter he would have done anything for her, and he accidentally kills her and allows himself to die because he now has no, nothing to live for. So Tom, as I said, brings the plane in closer in order to airlift them away. And the book ends with this line. This is the last line in the book. It's said by Hester. And I quote, You aren't a hero, and I'm not beautiful, and we probably won't live happily ever after, she said. But we're alive and together, and we're going to be all right, end quote. That's a great last line, a really, really good last line. It's a realistic last line as well. It's not pulling any punches from their reality. He's no hero. We just, had a, we just witnessed him being a coward. He had a moment of pure cowardice. She's not beautiful because she's hacked up and maimed. And who knows? Maybe they won't live happily ever after. Life can be long. They may do. But like she says, she's, she's a realist. She's in the now. They've survived this. They're together, and for now, they're going to be all right. It's an obvious cliffhanger angle setup for the later sequels, which is interesting considering what Philip Reeve had to say on the ending of Mortal Engines, taken from the Tall Tales and Short Stories interview, quote, There wasn't a plan for the Mortal Engines books. Indeed, I wasn't even considering sequels when I wrote the first one. I have to admit, that seems really, really hard to believe, given the cliffhanger ending of this. This is not tied up neatly with a bow. This is not a beginning, middle, end. You can close it and never look at it again, uh, and it be a self-contained story. This is the jumping off point for something that comes later. This is the origin story for what happens in the upcoming sequels. And there's just no, there's no getting around that. How can you even try and deny any other argument? It would be an empty, empty cause. Maybe this was something that happened during one of the major rewrites. I don't know. Maybe his quote is in direct relation to the very first manuscript. I'm not sure. That's not what the interview touches upon. That's not where it goes to. But what I can glean from this is he's saying that the plan for the Mortal Engines books wasn't to, pack, uh, wasn't to continue it past the first one. And I can tell you categorically that with that being the last line, with this being the ending of this first book, there were always sequels planned, it seemed. But again, maybe this was something that happened during a conversation with the publisher or a rewrite or something like that with the editor. And it's worth pointing out, if they both suffered from survivor's guilt prior to this, imagine what they'll be like now. You know, Tom openly admits he's no hero. He blames himself for the death of all the Londoners caused by a shooting down of the 13th floor elevator. And this is before he's even aware that Pod died. Um, again, though, like I guess he won't ever know who Pod is because they've never really cross ways apart from pod witnessing him being pushed down the chute. It's honestly a little bit comical in the way that he keeps somehow surviving while everyone else dies and then feels kind of bad about it. It's a little bit funny. Um, almost to the point where it kind of feels like, um, a fucking skit. I mean, Philip Reeve has this to say on his writing style. Once again, um, he says, quote, I never plan stories in advance, though I do rewrite them many times. So by the time I'm on the final drafts, I have a pretty good idea of what goes where. He goes on to say, Sometimes I kick these things around for several years before I put pen to paper. When I actually start writing, I usually have the first scene pretty clear in my head, and I just write that and then see what happens next. Again, he goes on to say, Usually I have a vague idea of what the ending will be, too, and I can write towards that, but quite often it changes as I go along. End quote. That's the life of the pantser. I mean, a lot of what we've seen within 
of mortal uh, within mortal engines is pretty not not cliche but predictable made more so because of the target audience the children that that is meant for i mean from day one when we were really introduced to these characters proper i couldn't help but feel that valentine would be remorseful by the end and and potentially do something or die in order to account for his past transgressions past transgressions and that's pretty much what's happened here but despite this despite the multiple redrafts despite the somewhat predictability despite the cliches despite uh, a couple of moments that just complete just demonstrate complete disconnect of logic within the mythology that he himself had created despite the flaws that exist within this book and there are a few undeniably as i've stated throughout the course of this in-depth geek dive review is this story officially too sweet or officially just not sweet enough? Philip Reeves' Mortal Engines is officially too sweet. I have to admit, I did enjoy the entire time that I had with the book. Uh, I thought that it was great fun to read. Once I was able to adjust to, okay, this is for kids and then... But it tackles some darker subjects and darker, um, more twisted themes, depressing themes, you know, survivor's guilt, things like that, as well as the bloodshed that that's, that's spilled, the way that it's written in order to describe the action. Uh, it was a great, a great romp, if you will, a good adventure story. And if you have a young teen in your family or as a brother or a sister or as a son or a daughter – I uh, recommend this book to them, man. Like, sure, you can point them in the way of the podcast, beat for beat. Remember, they'll know this story by the end of it. But that never is the same as experiencing it yourself, as I'm sure that you can all attest to. Uh, recommend it, man. That's what the officially too sweet means. You know, go check it out by all means. I had this little quote that I pulled from from Philip Reeve again, which I found a little bit inspirational, um, given my my personal situation pivoting the way I have. Remember, writestevewright.com. Check that out for my thoughts on pivoting and what that means within life. Quote, when I was little and I asked my parents how you got to be a writer, they would have told me that I'd need an idea, a pen, and a notebook. And that's what I try to tell children who ask me that question now. I don't want them getting the notion that you have to go to college and do an MA before you can be a writer. End quote. That's inspirational because there are other people that will give you the distinct impression that's what you need, that you are a fraud, that you are a fake, that you are not a writer, a genuine, true writer, because you don't have these pieces of paper adorning your wall that says as such that you've done creative writing, that you've done literature studies, whatever it happens to be. No, a writer is somebody that wants to tell a story. A writer is somebody who can tell a story. We can all get better at that, but you don't need to sink four, five, six years of your life into a higher education or creative writing group in order to do that. Philip Reeve, I 100% agree with you on this. I think it's inspirational to take it from that. And if any kid you know, in the future, knock on wood for me, I get that same opportunity, I'll tell them exactly the same what you just said, although it might be flipped slightly because obviously we've got computers now. Although when I was a kid, it would have been the same. Crack open a notebook and start writing. How do you be a writer? Start writing. And that's the beauty of what you're saying here is the simplicity of it, how obvious it is. No matter what those faux intellectuals, those fucking pretentious douchebags may have to say to you, the elite, it's not as complicated as they make it want, they, they want to make it seem. And I take hope in that because I have no contacts within this industry. I don't have the privilege of that silver spoon. No matter how small or tiny that silver spoon may be, I do not have one to utilize. So any success I may have going forward with Temporary, much like with Philip here with, with Mortal Engines, it will be through hard work, grit, and determination. He languished 10 years, I was reading in my interview, 10 years he worked at a bookstore between um, graduating from university, unrelated to writing, incidentally, uh, to to writing Mortal Engines, and or sorry, to committing to being an illustrator. Because you may have seen his work before. He's actually done a lot of work with the Horrible Histories books and things like that, which was a fun fact to learn. But between that and then his commitment to actually writing – to get this idea because it was so filmic in his head and to put it down on paper because he knew he couldn't translate it to film at that time, that's, that's, that's admirable. And I look up to that. 
So that's it, man. Mortal Engines, officially too sweet. Definitely put that on your, your read list. Thank you so much for listening. Let me know what you think about this review. Let me know what you think about Mortal Engines, especially if you've read it and you have opinions on it yourself. You know, let me know on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, email, whatever you want. I'm here to listen to your thoughts and uh, have a dialogue with you guys, man. That's what matters most to me. And if you like the episode, why not leave a tip? A couple of bucks maybe. You know, I usually say less than a cup of coffee. Hey, you know, you could leave as little as much as a, you know, a candy bar or something like that, a box of cereal. And it helps the show to no end. Help me get, you know, pay off the server costs, get better equipment, maybe even get me in a position where I can give you more content as a content creator. That's what I would absolutely love to do. And it starts with you. PayPal.me slash sweet story bro. That's PayPal.me slash sweet story bro. If you enjoy the time we've spent together talking about story, dissecting it, going beat for beat, round for round, why not show that appreciation just a little bit, man, and swing a few bucks my way? I promise you I'd appreciate it, and you'd be pretty much my most favorite person in the world, I gotta say. And of course, if you like the sound of Mortal Engines, why not go to SweetStoryBro.com, click on the Amazon links at the top, and buy yourself your very own copy. I get a small percentage of that sale, and you know what that does? That helps the show. Be sure to share this show and any other show with your story-loving friends, too. Go back. Look at the back catalog. If one of your friends is talking about maybe playing Until Dawn, hey, that was my very first episode. Share the episode with them. See what they think about that. You know, share the love. Spread the conversation and be a part of the entire sweet story bro experience. A story soldier, no less. So until next time, man, be sure to keep your eyes on the Twitter feed for the Monday mention, which will let you know what the next story will be so you can read it, watch it, play it, whatever it happens to be, ready in time for the next episode. So until that time, my friends, I implore you to go enjoy some stories. I'm out. If you enjoyed today's episode reviewing Philip Reeves' Mortal Engines, why not check out audibletrial.com slash sweetstorybro. By hitting up that website, you get yourself a free audiobook as well as a 30-day trial to their service, which is amazing, incidentally. So if you're interested in the works of Philip Reeve, head on over there because there's a couple of books that you can grab for absolutely nothing. Why not check out his book, Railhead? That's what I'm recommending to you right now, Railhead by Philip Reeve. Available for you for free by going to audibletrial.com slash sweetstorybro.